Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm really honored and humbled to be among you. I attended some of the sessions in the morning, and I'm really impressed by the quality of the speakers and the sessions. And this uh, very young and energetic uh, attendance, this speaks really very well for MSF. Before this uh, uh, speech, one of my friends who is an MSF member, uh, he texted me a couple of weeks ago and he said, I heard that you're going to be the speaker in MSF Science Day. I said, yes, uh, is that uh, important? He said, of course it's important. Uh, and then he, he sent me this email. Um, I, he said, MSF is great. I love both MSF and SAMS. I'm, I'm from an organization called Syrian American Medical Society, SAMS. But when it comes to Syria, MSF um, wishes it were SAMS. That's his quote. Uh, <laughs> keep that in mind, he said. Five years into the crisis, MSF is still looking uh, to SAMS for guidance in spite of having 45 years of more experience and 30 times the budget. Um, I congratulate you for having 45 years of experience and very large budget, and actually we are learning from you. Um, you know, really I believe that SAMS um, is here because of you. You paved the way in the last 45 years for us uh, to be able to uh, challenge a failing system and save more lives. Uh, and let me go into the presentation. Um, and it's always good to see good friends like my friend here from ICRC London, uh, Marcus Gieser, um, who is always good to see you. And uh, he used to be in the United States, uh, and now he's stationed here in uh, London. Uh, London is a beautiful city. I used to stop in London with my family uh, every time uh, coming from Syria uh, to watch Harry Potter movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, you're setting it, uh, a lot of good trends uh, for the rest of the world, uh, including the election of a good mayor uh, lately. <laughs> Um, so uh, I'll start with this uh, slide from an event that we've done uh, in the fall of last year. Uh, and this was done in coordination with uh, Physicians for Human Rights and also with um, uh, MSF USA. Uh, you're um, the president of, uh, Sam, of uh, MSF USA, Dr. Diane uh, Marshbaim, was there and spoke. And this is called a die-in. At that time, we wanted to demonstrate in front of the United Nations that 670 healthcare professionals in Syria were killed because they are trying to save lives. Uh, that uh, event happened after the bombing of uh, MSF uh, uh, hospital by my government in Kunduz in Afghanistan. And it happened uh, also um, um, after 670 physicians in Syria were killed. Uh, and there were many physicians there. You see only part of the picture, but there were about 300 physicians. Most of them are not Syrian Americans who demonstrated in front of the UN. Unfortunately, now we are talking about Syria after another bombing uh, of MSF facility in Aleppo, Al-Quds Hospital, and the killing of the last pediatrician in Aleppo, Dr. Uh, Wasim Ma'az. Uh, so this is something is ongoing. At that time, there were 670 people or healthcare professionals who were killed in Syria, and now we have 730 healthcare professionals who were killed uh, in Syria. Um, this is an article that uh, uh, I co-wrote in American Thoracic Society. I'm a critical care specialist, and it talks about the impact of war on the healthcare system in Syria. And some of these images are very famous, uh, including the images of, um, and I'm, I'm sorry for the graphic nature of this image, of children uh, who died or suffocated, suffocated to death in East al Ghouta uh, in uh, August uh, 23rd, uh, 2013, after the Syrian gas massacre. One of my friends who is an anesthesiologist in one of the small hospitals in Ain Terma in East al Ghouta told me that his hospital capacity is only 20 beds. And at that time, he had an influx within two hours of 700 patients struggling to breathe. And he had to decide which patient who need to be put on the ventilator and which patient that would not need to be put on the ventilator. By the end of the night, he had 144 of these 700 patients dead, including 44 children. Uh, so that will give you a scale of the challenges that doctors in Syria are dealing with. We're not only dealing with conventional weapons, but also they are dealing with unconventional weapons. Um, this is pictures from uh, the uh, Syria uh, before the crisis, a picture of Damascus with lights. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the Umayyad Mosque, and this is a place where John the Baptist and Imam Hussein and uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi 
uh, are buried in the same mosque. So Syrians consider th themselves the descendant of John the Baptist, of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, of uh, Imam Hussein. Very beautiful site in Damascus, old Damascus. This is a picture of a church in my city, Homs, and it's a picture of a city of Hama. Uh, all of these uh, cities are important in the du during the crisis. My city, Homs, at one point called the heart of the crisis or the heart of the revolution. Um, and this is a picture that is very depicting to what's happened in the last five years. Syria uh, descended into darkness, literally. This is a study that was done by Ch Chinese physicians um, uh, or researchers who took pictures of Syria uh, from the satellite at night in 2011, compared them to pictures of Syria in the satellite at night in December 2014. And as you see, many of the lights went out. 83% of the light went out in five years in Syria. Aleppo, which is a large city in Syria, there's no lights in 2014, December 2013. Um, you have more lights actually in Turkey because you have large displacement of Syrians to Turkey and also to Jordan. But the reason that you have more lights is because of multiple things. First of all, the destruction of infrastructures, the people leaving Syria, and we're talking about refugee crisis, uh, we have 4.8 million refugees uh, who left Syria. And because of siege, areas un under siege in Syria has no electricity. Uh, and all, it all started with, um, with the demonstrations uh, in the part of the Arab Spring um, that uh, people, young people in Syria wanted to have political reform. And um, you know, I was reading a few days ago one of, uh, the, uh, of the presidents of MSF when he uh, uh, um, received the Nobel Prize uh, for Peace. And he said that humanitarianism is not a tool uh, to end war or create peace. It is a citizen's response to political failure. What we are seeing in Syria is really political failure from all parties, including the, uh, the, the Syrian government, the regional powers, and the international power, including the United Nations Security Council. Um, if um, the uh, responsible powers acted early in Syria, we would not have what we have right now in Syria in terms of the crisis. This is a picture of a second grade uh, uh, student in the city of Aleppo who, were asked, who was asked to um, to draw something. And usually children, when they ask to draw, they draw uh, happy children playing, uh, rivers, trees, sun. Um, and uh, But he uh, chose to draw uh, children crying. You have a helicopter uh, dropping barrel bombs. You have house on fire. And you have children with amputated heads and, um, and arms. Uh, every time I look at this picture, uh, you know, it influenced me because you have children who are crying they are still alive, but the dead ones are smiling. Before the conflict, uh, Syria was a middle-income country with good healthcare benchmarks. Uh, we had actually some of the best uh, benchmarks for healthcare compared to the regional um, uh, countries in Syria, in spite of the low spending on healthcare by the government, about uh, $100 per citizen at that time. Um, most of the healthcare were provided by government-run hospital and primary care facilities, and we had only advanced medical care in major cities like uh, Damascus, Aleppo, Homs, and Latakia. The rural uh, health or rural areas had insuff insufficient facilities. Um, we had also a transformation of uh, healthcare that is catering to uh, infectious diseases and malnutrition uh, in the 70s to healthcare that is focused on non-communicable diseases. We had an epidemic of smoking. So Syria had the highest smoking rate in, in the Middle East. Uh, about 70% of men smoke in Syria. Uh, we had an epidemic of obesity. We have epidemic of hypertension, diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, and cardiac diseases. That was the main killer of the population before the crisis. In spite of that, the vaccination rate was very high, more than 95%. And the benchmark in terms of mortality for uh, pregnant women uh, and children was uh, actually some of the best in the region. Um, now, five years into the crisis, uh, all of that was erased. Uh, and I always use this quote for uh, Valerie Amos, the past UN chief for humanitarian affairs, who said, every time we use a new figure in relation to the Syrian crisis, we say it is unprecedented. And these are some of the figures from the Syrian crisis, and some of you are familiar with it. 470,000 people were killed, 1.9 million injured, 13 million in urgent need for humanitarian assistance. The total population of Syria is 22 million. 
4.4 million registered refugee, and I had to update that yesterday, the UNHCR report, and they said right now that your registered refugees is 4.8 million. Uh, 7.8 million IDPs, UNHCR, UNHCR expects 8.7 million this year to be internally displaced in Syria. 800,000 in besieged areas, 5.5 million children affected by the crisis. Four out of five Syrians have no jobs. Uh, we have a lost generation. We have this disintegration of the public health care system. We have a regional crisis because of the refugee. We have refugee crisis, not only in the region, but also in Europe because of Syria. We have terrorism that feeds on the chaos and the void of leadership. And the average life expectancy in Syria went down from 76 years to 56 <coughs> years. In four years, we dropped 20 years in life expectancy. This is one study in the British Medical Journal about the number of civilians who were killed in four years, or in the first four years in the crisis. Most of the death happened in non-government controlled areas, uh, more than 90% of the death. And as you, these are the causes of death of civilians. Uh, you have, of course, uh, small guns shooting, you have shelling, and you have air bombardment, which is increasing in percentage of uh, killing the uh, civilians. In the last few months, most of the civilian deaths was, were related to air bombardment, either by barrel bombs or by fighter jets, so whether it's Syrian fighter jets or whether it's Russian uh, fighter, fighter jets. Uh, about 25% of Syrian civilians who were killed were women and children. So who is killing civilians in Syria? The media focus on this. And of course, the elephant in the room is this. And I would like you to focus on this, because this is where the solution uh, is found. Uh, of course, we have to focus on ISIS. They are an extreme, extre extremist group. They're very brutal, and they had to be, they, there is no place for them in Syria. But this is what's causing most of the deaths in Syria, the Syrian government and their uh, supporters. Um, the impact of the Syrian war um, is huge. You know, we have influx of trauma cases. 1.9 million Syrians have disabilities or have trauma related to the violence, to the bombing, to the shelling, amputations, losing eyes, spinal cord injuries, infections, chronic infections. We have disability related to that. We have psychological trauma, which is really uncounted for. 65% um, of Syrian refugees in Lebanon have some type of psychiatric trauma post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, uh, anxiety, bedwetting for children, and so forth. We have attacks on healthcare and medical neutrality. We have destruction of infrastructure, shortage of medical supplies and human resources, siege. Uh, we have about 800,000 people under siege. Epidemics of infectious diseases, and including polio at one point. We have severe malnutrition that we've never witnessed in Syria before. We have increased morbidity and mortality because of non-communicable diseases, which is still probably the main killer of people in Syria, not the violence. We have unconventional weapon attacks, uh, uh, chemical weapon attacks, displacement of refugee and refugee crisis. We have torture and human rights violation and exploitation of women and children. All of this is because of the crisis in, in, in the war. So if you condense world crises, and in five years, the end product will be what we are seeing right now in Syria. That's why Syria is important. It's the worst humanitarian crisis in our lifetime. Uh, this is a report that we published in 2013 called Risking Lives to Save Lives, the Ordeal of Medical Personnel in Syria. It talks about the ordeal of Syrian physicians and nurses and how come that they have to struggle every day to save people with very limited resources, without support from the international community, and risking their lives. Every day you have physicians or nurses who can be injured or killed because of what they are doing, because they are trying to save life. And this should not happen. This should not happen in the 21st century, 150 years after the Geneva Convention. This is Al Kindi Hospital, one of the largest medical center in Aleppo before the crisis. And this is the picture of the same place after the crisis. I took the picture myself uh, in the city of Aleppo. Um, and as you say, the whole building is destroyed. This is a medical center that cost the Syrian uh, taxpayers $350 million. It's the largest medical center in northern Syria before the crisis. Many of my colleagues were trained in this center, and now uh, it is like this. This is the same picture with ambulances. Uh, one time I attended uh, um, a workshop by uh, MSF about um, uh, working under fire or healthcare under fire. Uh, and uh, at that time, they were telling us that you have to put the emblem of the Red Cross or Red Crescent on the ambulances to protect them. In Syria, we actually advocate not to. 
because that means they, they will be target, especially from the, from the skies. 75% of ambulances in Syria were destroyed because of the dark uh, target uh, destruction. This is uh, one of the report of the Physicians for Human Rights, the last report. 730 healthcare professionals were killed. 359 hospitals were attacked. 91% of the killing done by the Syrian government. Russian attacks replaced the Syrian government in terms of targeting health care. Attacks increased in intensity and frequency by time. 70% of doctors in Syria have forced to leave Syria because of the crisis. 70% in a developing country. East Aleppo, which has a, um, a population of two, 2 million before the crisis, right now have a population of 250, 250,000. It has only 60 physicians. Um, we have only two vascular surgeons among them. In East al Ghota, which is under siege, 90% of medical staff have left. And that's why you have medical students, you have nurses who sometimes do operations on patients to save lives. This is Dr. Abdul Aziz. I took this picture with him after his hospital in Aleppo, Al Zarzur Hospital, was, bom was bombed. And his main concern, he's the head of uh, surgeon in that hospital, was to salvage some medical supplies in the hospital uh, to uh, use it to save lives for the next patient. Who is doing killing? Focus, the media focuses on this, of medical workers. But of course, this is the largest culprit. Uh, of course, because of the crisis in Syria, we have a refugee crisis. Uh, Europe is suffering from the refugee crisis, and that's why you have more attention to what's happening in Syria. Not because the, the population and civilians are suffering, and the healthcare, uh, civilian, uh, healthcare workers in Syria are suffering, but because the refugees right now um, reach Europe, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm heading to Greece after this um, uh, visit. Uh, we have uh, medical missions to Greece. But as you know, more than 500,000 Syrians arrived to Europe last year only. 500,000 Syrians arrived to Greece, took the dangerous trip from Turkey to Greece and then to Germany and other countries in Europe. And we really appreciate the hospitality and the welcoming by the, by the European people, especially in Germany and Sweden and France and other countries that open their arms and, and houses and hearts to the Syrian refugees. Uh, in 2014, we had 100,000 refugees in Syria. If this pace continued, and it will continue because the crisis in Syria is still happening, you expect to have more than 500,000 refugees coming to Europe this year. Um, I talked with some of those refugees uh, in Greece, and they told me that uh, they are leaving, by the way, from Syria, not from Turkey. These are refugees who leave Syria through Turkey, and they, they go to Greece because they want to have safety and they, have, they want to have future for their children. And many of them were telling me that many of their friends also uh, gave up on what's happening in Syria, and they are planning to take the same uh, trip. This is a picture of the largest refugee camp in the Middle East. Uh, it's the second largest uh, refugee camp in the world after uh, the, um, the uh, Dab uh, refugee camp. And this is the fifth largest city in Jordan, Al Zaatari camp. This is a picture of a refugee camp on the uh, Greek uh, Macedonian border in an uh, area called Edomini. And uh, you see many of the refugees here, most of them are from Syria, but you also have refugees from Iraq, from Kurdistan, from Iran, and other countries. And many of them have fled Syria because of the bombing. I've seen uh, Syrian refugees from Dar'a, from Nawa, from other places, they fl fled from the bombing. Um, the healthcare system right now is fragmented. So you have healthcare system in a uh, government controlled area that is acting probably near normal. And you have healthcare system that is being under attack by uh, the uh, different armed group controlled areas. And you have healthcare system that is under the control of ISIS, which is a black hole. We don't know what's happening there, but there is a huge shortage. And we have also, also healthcare system that is uh, controlled by different Kurdish group. So we have at least four different systems of healthcare in Syria because of the crisis. Uh, this is one of the reports that we produced last year, and uh, I testified in front of the United Nations about um, the ordeal and life and death in Syrian communities under siege. We have more than 50 communities in Syria under siege, about 800,000 people. And at that time, Ambassador, um, Ambassador uh, Samantha Power, um, our um, UN ambassador in the United States, uh, you know, told the media that everyone who listened to the presentation was in tears. And we're talking about United Nations Security Council ambassador. We don't really need tears from uh, ambassadors in the United Nations. We need action. We need to prevent this happening. Um, these are some of the facts about siege. We have 
uh, different areas and their seas in Syria. There is no electricity, water, and phone lines, no sewage treatment and garbage collection in these uh, areas under siege. East Al Ghouta, which is a large um, uh, area in Syria that uh, has about 400,000 people, has no electricity for 3.5 years, for three and a half years. Imagine yourself without electricity for one hour. Uh, this is the siege impact, and this is Lamar Al Omar, uh, seven months. She has severe malnutrition, and some of the pictures probably you've seen on social media. It's one of the effective ways to let people know what's happening in Syria because um, reporters are not allowed into Malaya and other areas under siege. And uh, the United Nations and other agencies are stationed in Syria. Their performance is really terrible. They are reaching only 3.6% of the population, 0.5% of, of them with, with food. Vaccination rates about 25%. 80% of pregnancies are ending with C-section because women do not have access to hospitals in the middle of the night. So they have to plan their uh, end of pregnancies. Um, we have medical supplies and food, um, including baby milk and meat, that are removed from the convoys when they are allowed into areas under siege, including Daraya just two days ago, when the U UN convoy were, was allowed finally the uh, uh, checking points, they removed the baby milk and medications from the convoy and then prevented the convoy from going in. Because of that, you have this extreme situation where medical students are doing surgeries and uh, on flashlight. I'm gonna skip this uh, chemical open. Uh, by the way, it's still happening. Uh, let me just spend the last two minutes about what happened in terms of uh, adaptation to what's happening in Syria and how are we dealing with the situation. This is a picture of uh, emergency room in Aleppo where you see the usual things you see in the emergency room, but, but also you see sandbags to protect the physicians and nurses uh, from, uh, from uh, bombs and barrel bombs. Um, there is no electricity, there is no diesel fuel in East Al Ghouta. They are producing uh, energy by methane, methane gas. So they, they're changing, they are transforming animal waste into methane gas to, uh, gener to open or to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to be used for the generators to uh, produce uh, electricity. Many of our facilities in Syria right now is under, uh, uh, underground. We have 22 facilities underground to provide protection for patients and for hospitals. Uh, six out of the Syrian gov uh, governorates, uh, the, we have facilities that are underground. Um, this is Dr. Hassan Al-Araj. He's a head of our direct, uh, uh, medical directorship in Hama. And uh, if you look at this picture, it's a normal picture of a hospital, right? You have monitor, you have ventilator, you have a patient here who's behind the Dr. Hassan Al-Araj who has SVT. And Dr. Hassan Al-Araj, I visited him in this facility uh, just two months ago. This is the facility from the outside. This is a mountain. This is the facility from the inside. Do you know what's the name of this facility? For those who, who understand Arabic, Mashfa al Magara al Markazi, the Central Cave Hospital of Syria. <laughs> it's funny. But it's painful. You know what happened to Dr. Hassan Al-Araj? Just three weeks ago, he was inspecting his facility, and after he left, his car was targeted by air-to-surface muscle, heat-seeking missiles, and he was killed. He was the only cardiologist in that area in Syria. Uh, we use telemedicine uh, to reach areas in, uh, in Syria. So we have a camera. I can look at my iPhone, and I can connect to ICUs in Syria where they can uh, show me the patients, I can talk with the physicians, um, they can uh, seek our advice and about what to do with critically ill patients. So we are using telemedicine or electronic ICU to reach difficult to, um, uh, to reach areas in Syria. We are using technology, we train Syrian physicians on how to use portable ultrasound. Um, and uh, they, we had a study that showed 80% of them were capable to use portable ultrasound and use it uh, to manage their patients uh, who have a trauma. And this is a patient, I took this also myself in the city of Aleppo, who had the shrapnels and they were looking, uh, doing surgery in him and they're looking at his heart with a portable ultrasound. Uh, they are, we are doing teaching, teleteaching also. This is Dr. Basil Atasi, who's uh, in Chicago. He's providing instruction to medical students in East Al Ghouta uh, through the internet. And you can ask me how come that they have internet and there's no electricity. They are using uh, car batteries to operate the internet. 
Uh, so there's always solutions. Uh, so in uh, 2014, we were able to serve 1.3 million. In 2015, we were able to, uh, to serve 2.3 million. And we have many facilities, including hospitals, mobile clinics, uh, ICUs, emergency room, birth centers, uh, and so forth. In spite of the challenges, uh, in 2015, we had 72 attacks on our on, uh, on 25 facilities that we had. We lost so far 27 healthcare professionals and 50 were injured. But we believe that we can do a lot, especially in coordination with our other partners. So we have coalitions, we call it American Relief Coalition for Syria, that is addressing the crisis, uh, the crisis in Syria in multiple aspects. And we always hopeful for the future. We believe that Syrian children and the young people of Syria and the diaspora will build uh, their country. Um, let, me, let me end with this uh, you know, statement. Uh, um, I uh, had the, the pleasure uh, to meet with President Obama in August of 2013. And at the, that was a, an event in the White House. And I told him at that time, I delivered a letter on behalf of Sam's. I told him, I think your legacy will be determined by, by what, you, what you do in Syria. And, and he laughed and he said, but my legacy will be determined by other things also. I told him, but your legacy will be determined by what you do in Syria. Uh, I think our legacy will be determined by what we do in Syria. Um, in the first session, uh, Dr. Louise um, Lores, the deputy, deputy executive director of UNAID said that if the UN follow your lead, uh, the world would have been much better. I believe in that statement. Thank you very much.